This is Duke University. How's the, the, uh, the day been so far? Pretty good? Yeah? Good, good. Um, well, we are now at the closing keynote. Um, we are very excited to have a fantastic crew here today. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce the moderator for today, Dr. Richard Newell. And uh, so I'm going to tell you just a little bit about Richard. Um, besides being the beacon of all things energy here at Duke, He's the Gendel Professor of Energy and Environmental Economics. Uh, he's also the director of the Duke University Energy Initiative. He has his BS and BA from Rutgers University, I won't say the years, um, an MPA from Princeton and a PhD from Harvard. Uh, Newell's expertise lies in the economics of energy and environmental markets, policies and technologies, as well as climate change, energy efficiency, and market-based environmental policy. Uh, thanks, thanks very much for that uh, kind of introduction. It's been, a, a, I think, a fabulous conference, and I'm, I'm really pleased uh, that you all could stay. And, um, and I don't want to forget to also tell you afterward, we're going to have a great reception um, across the way at, at Gross Hall as part of our uh, monthly energy mix. Uh, but we're here to have a conversation about uh, the very significant changes over the last uh, decade or, or so uh, in U.S. unconventional oil and gas production. Um, U.S. energy production uh, has really dramatically changed uh, over the last uh, decade, um, and it's been in large part due to the application of uh, horizontal drilling and hydraulic fracturing to shale formations. Um, in 2005, uh, shale gas production was maybe 1%, close to zero as, as a fraction of U.S. Uh, natural gas production, and now it's about 40% of U.S. total dry gas production. Um, U.S. gas reserves are now at a historical high, and the U.S. is headed for potentially ex being a net exporter of natural gas as opposed to a, an importer of natural gas, which is where we had been and where we looked like we were increasingly headed. Uh, over the same period, U.S. tight oil production has increased from about uh, less than a half a million barrels per day to about three and a half million barrels per day, which is bringing U.S. crude production from five to over eight million barrels per day. Now, in a global oil market where year-on-year -year increases at a global level are usually measured in about a million barrels per day, that kind of an increase in U.S. domestic production uh, is, is really un unheard of. Um, so to help us make sense of all this, uh, this very significant change, we're lucky to have two very uh, distinguished Duke alumni uh, who've been in directly engaged in these oil and gas developments, uh, Simon Rich chairman of RKI Exploration and Production, and Ralph Eads, vice chairman of uh, Jeffries LLC. Uh, Ralph uh, Eads is a, a 1981 Duke graduate. He is now vice chairman of Jeffries LLC, uh, which is a U.S. investment bank where he leads the firm's global energy practice. Uh, Jeffries has been a leading merger, acquisition, and divestiture advisor for the oil and gas industry. And since 2007, Jeffries has completed 42 resource deals for over $150 billion. So we're really lucky to have somebody who's been directly engaged in that uh, with us today. Ralph was previously president at Merchant Energy Group at El Paso Corporation. He's also managing director and co-head of the energy group at Donaldson, Lufs Lufkin, and Jenrette. And he was managing director and head of energy at SG Warburg and Company. Uh, Ralph has maintained his ties with Duke uh, in a variety of roles over the years. Uh, he's been on the board of trustees since 2009. Before that, he served on the board of visitors of the Fuqua School of Business, the Trinity College, and uh, Stanford School of Public Policy. So really thrilled to have uh, Ralph here today with us. Um, this is Ralph here. Uh, Cy, to my immediate left here, Cy Rich, is a 1967 uh, Duke graduate who's active in increasing understanding and sustainability of our energy uh, sector through his strategic direction investments and operational experience. He's chairman and co-founder of RKI Exploration and Production uh, based in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. RKI is actively drilling and producing oil and gas in the Powder River Basin of Wyoming and the Permian Basin of New Mexico. Uh, previously, Cy was a CEO and chairman of the board of, of Louis Dreyfus Natural Gas. Um, Cy still lives in North Carolina where he serves on the board of Triangle Capital Corporation, a business uh, development company 
uh, that is operating throughout the Southeast. And Sai has been uh, really engaged with Duke, the Duke University uh, in the energy space for uh, over a decade. So we really appreciate uh, Sai's ongoing involvement. So uh, we really are going to have a conversation. So I'm going to turn now uh, to a series of questions. We'll spend about um, 25 minutes, a half hour, uh, talking. And then we'll, then we'll open it up to, to a conversation uh, from the audience. So I'm going to start with... Uh, uh, Ralph, and ask you, Ralph, you know, when, when did you first become aware of commercial shale gas development? Um, so that would have been in about uh, 2005 or six, and you know, the first play in the United States was the Barnett Shale, uh, which is located around Fort Worth, Texas, and uh, there was a company called Mitchell Energy, an individual named George Mitchell, who uh, was sort of spent 10 years trying to figure out the technology of horizontal drilling and fracture stimulation. And the, the real challenge with uh, fracture stimulation has been around for 50 years, so it's not new technology. But the idea of doing it in multiple stages within a horizontal was the, was the, the, the key technical challenge because you pump sand and water in the earth at high pressure to break the rocks up. But the issue became if uh, without being able to direct where that went in a well bore, it would normally find the path of least resistance, so it was ineffective. But they learned how to set, which is actually technically very complex. You know, you, you remember you're drilling down into the earth, five, six, seven thousand feet, you're making a length of pipe turn a 90 degree angle, uh, then you drill out a mile, so down a mile and a half, let's say, out a mile. It's an, it's an aperture this big you're working in. Uh, at generally very high pressure and temperature. And then what they've been able, what the learning was, was to set plugs in that well such that you could take a 100 foot section of the well, perforate it, and then pump sand and water into it at high pressure, not have that break, so that you could target where the frack went. That was the technology, and it took about 10 years to develop it. George Mitchell basically thought it up. But I became aware of it in about 2005 and six because it began to work in the Barnett Shale. The interesting thing, of course, with the Barnett Shale, relatively speaking, it's probably the worst from a geologic point of view of the shales. It just happened to be where George Mitchell started. The ones we found after that were actually better technically uh, from a point of view of its geologic property. So to answer that question succinctly, 2005 or six. So how about you? When did you first become well, aware of this development? Well, the, historically it started just as Ralph, as Ralph said. And uh, at that point, you know, I was here at Duke uh, uh, pushing a green agenda, <laughs> and so uh, I was I was watching it uh, very intently because, you know, we, at that period, and Ralph, you remember it well. I mean, I, you know, natural gas was was hitting fourteen, fifteen dollars uh, an MCF. The peak oil guys were were just beating the drum that you know we were running out of oil and gas, and at the same time, you know, this 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 paradigm shift is happening right under our noses. And uh, I remember one, uh, we were talking out in the hall, but a gentleman who helped me when we were first starting the energy program here was Matt Simmons, uh, who's now deceased. But Matt was a real bear as far as energy production was concerned, and particularly shale. And Matt had a theory, there's, there's what Ralph's very familiar with, but what's called the B factor. And when you'd, you'd, you'd crack, frack all these, these wells, there was a whole group of, of uh, really astute technologists who were saying, you're going to get this, this rampant production, but it's not going to turn and amount to anything. It's just the, the point at which it turns in its decline curve is not going to be where they think it is. And there was a lot of people betting on that. To be honest, I was one of them. I, I, I thought it was going to be a flash in the pan. Yeah. But it wasn't. They, everybody was wrong. The B factor was actually much higher than everyone thought. And the wells that were, were drilled almost 10 years ago are you know, still actively producing. So, so that B factor is kind of an interesting point. And, and a B factor is a, it's basically a mathematical formula that, you know, when a, in a shale well, the shale well is, a, is two wells, actually. In its early life, the wells decline quite rapidly. And then they exhibit what's known as hyperbolic decline. And then they normally flatten out. And so what they flatten out to is the B factor. Right? That's the long-term terminal decline of the well. 
So if the you know if that terminal decline in percentage terms is quite high, then the well you know just goes and at the end of five years it's it's depleted. And that was there was early thinking that was going to happen. And in fact, the wells have exhibited a, a, a more shallow, longer term decline. But the reason for that, and I, this is kind of an interesting point of historical fact because it relates to something that is a long term trend with this this uh, this resource. In oil and gas, the, the, the two things more or less that describe the performance of an oil and gas well is porosity and permeability. Porosity is what describes the amount of pore space in the rock that can contain oil and gas and water. Um, so, so, you know, the first question you ask yourself, is there a volume of hydrocarbon in this rock space that's you know, worth getting? Then the question becomes, how is it going to come out? And that's really described by the physical properties of permeability. Now, the historical model of permeability is called pore throat permeability. The notion being that you have pebbles of sand, and between that sand, those sand pebbles, you have little rivers or little channels. It's pore throat permeability. That's the standard model in oil and gas. That model, had you applied it to shales, would have said that the wells were going to die. But in fact, the permeability properties of these reservoirs is something different. It's microfractures. The most fascinating thing about that whole discussion is even today, the scientists cannot fully explain how it works. They don't know. They, they can exhibit, based on historical performance, what's happening, but they don't understand how it works. The reason that's quite, and the reason they don't is because we're dealing in such small, small, uh, uh, you know, nano uh, permeabilities that, and, and when you go take a section of that rock and, and, you know, drill a core and pull it out of the earth, you disturb it. So you can't even look at this under a microscope. The consequence of that is very important, though, because today, on average, the, shale, the, the, the gas shales, we're going to recover, let's call it 20% of the gas in place. Now, in 1955, I read a paper from the Society of Petroleum Engineers that in 1955, in the um, San Juan Basin, which before the advent of the shales was the largest gas field in the United States, that the predicted ultimate recovery of gas in place in 1955 by the SPE was 55%. Today, the actual recovery from the Fruitland Coal Seam, which is the main producer, is 105% of gas in place. So you go, well, what happened? Well, what happened was technology got better and we learned how to get more gas out of it, but also we learned effectively how to tap the neighboring horizons, which also had gas in them. The only reason I bring all that up, and, and that had to do with the evolution over some 50 years of how to recover natural gas from that reservoir. If we're at 20% today in the gas shales and we don't understand the permeability system, there seems to me to be a high probability that over time we'll figure out how to take 20 from to 30 to 40 to 50 to 60. It's a really important point. Richard, going back to when yeah. the first, uh, and of course my, uh, you know, I didn't think it was going to amount to anything. At the same time, uh, a gentleman who I had hired in 1990, who we worked together at Louis Dreyfus, and we had sold Louis Dreyfus natural gas in 2001 to Dominion, came to me and, and basically he laid out uh, this particular shale in Wyoming that was oil bearing, and, and he comes to me and he's, he's giving me the same story, um, and he said, you know, Simon, how would you like to do it again? And I said, you know, Ronnie, I'm you know, doing this here, you know, I'm chairman of Environmental Defense Fund in North Carolina. Uh, I'm not sure I want to, you know, start another oil and gas company. And he said, oh, come on. We're just, just going to be, this, look, this is something I want to do, and, you know, and why don't you help me raise the money? But the long and the short of that was everything that we were learning then that was happening in the Haynesville and the Marcellus you know, our little group of geologists in Oklahoma City, we were applying it to an oil bearing shale in Wyoming. And we, we were ultimately right. Yeah, yeah. So, 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 Ralph, when did you personally get first involved in uh, shale gas development? What, is, what has been your involvement? Well, um, so in about 2007, uh, uh, another Duke graduate and my uh, best buddy named Aubrey McClendon came to me and said, you know, uh, they had, his company had become active in the Barnett Shale. And then in about 2007, he came to me and he said, you know, we found another one. And that was an aha event because I said, well, there's lots of shale bodies in the United States 
And sure, if it works in the Barnett Shale, why doesn't it work here, here, and here? And um, Aubrey came to me and said, you know, I've, we, we found the Barnett Shale, and they had another one, which was called the, the Woodford Shale, and, and he said, you know, I need capital for this. So at that time, there was also known was the Marcellus Shale and uh, the Fayetteville Shale. And so I sat down with a piece of paper. I got a piece of pad out, and I started adding up. I said, wow, how much capital is it going to take to develop all these shales? Well, the number that I came up with was $100 billion, $82 billion. I said, man, you know, that, that's, that's a lot of capital for the, for the original three shales. Now, I think that number today is more like $750 billion. Okay, so the shales have grown, the capital needs have grown, the infrastructure and all that. In just the U.S. or internationally? In the U.S. Just in the U.S. So that's the kind of long-term number. I can take you through the mathematics on that. Um, and <clears throat> so that I had, a real, I had a really basic insight, which is, you know, the stock market for these companies that own the assets is not likely to finance that. So what I did was we developed a technical uh, sort of uh, uh, book on the shales, which we called the shale book. And I literally went around the world and saw every single big oil company in the world and said, this is the next big thing. Here's the technical basis for it. The capital needs are gigantic. Um, you know, doing what I do for a living, which is intermediate capital flows. I said, I've got to get in the middle of all those capital flows. And that led to all this activity. Uh, downstream of that. But it was really that call from Aubrey that caused me to sit down and say, how much money is involved here, right? And what I realized very quickly is this was a, a, a transformational, you know, uh, uh, event for, 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 for the U.S. oil and gas industry and for the U.S. economy. Um, you know, that's a, yeah. what Ralph just brought up, and I can say this, he can't say this about himself, but there, were, there are three men, you know, you, you talk about this being a big company industry, but there were three individuals that really created this transformation. One's already been mentioned, George Mitchell, who pioneered horizontal drilling and fracking the, the horizontal, the laterals. And then Aubrey McClendon. Uh, Aubrey had this vision of, you had, to, you had to amass huge acreages, because he saw, uh, and I'm speaking from, you know, not from a geologist's point of view, but my own understanding, you know, this became a resource play. This was not uh, finding traps or little reservoirs of oil and gas. What we understood was this was, the, this was the source rock. This was where all the oil and gas came from, and it would literally cover, you know, millions of acres. And so what Aubrey did was jumped out, and he just had a land organization that was amazing, and they accumulated huge amounts of acreage, which allowed this technology, and then... This gentleman comes along, and he pioneered a, a very straightforward way to show the financial markets that you could really put $182 billion into this and, and get a return. And, uh, and that, that just broke it loose. So has the, has the magnitude of this surprised you, Cy? Absolutely. Like, at what point did you say, my, you know, my gosh, well, something... Tremendous is happening here. Well, you know, I, I told you a, a, a year or so ago that I was not going to teach because I, I had to go out and raise some money. Right. And uh, we, we, uh, we had this little oil and gas company in Oklahoma. We, we went to uh, Aubrey McClendon because we knew his vision for size. And we laid out our, our prospect in Wyoming. And we made a deal. And uh, Aubrey went out and leased a million acres. Classic. Aubrey McClendon. We were a 50% owner of the million acres, and we started drilling. And, uh, and of course, it w they were successful, but what we were faced with was now keeping up with Chesapeake. We were a little private group of a few guys, and, and Chesapeake is about to turn, you know, 10 rigs loose at, you know, $10 million a well, and one of these rigs is going to drill five or six wells a year, and there's 10 of them running. And, uh, so I had to hit the road and start knocking on doors and put my old hat on and, and raise some money. And, uh, and of course, we, we were able to raise the money and, and we're able to keep up with our, our partner yeah. on, on that. So it was when I was faced with, with having to raise you know, amounts of money that ended with a B that I realized that this was just 
this is huge, you know, and, it, and, it, and this was just, as Ralph said, it was just the beginning of it. You know, we had 10 rigs running. If you were really going to, you know, uh, bring the present value of a million acres out, you, you know, you should have 50 rigs running. So, Ralph, it sounds like, a, like an aha moment for you was your, your $80 billion napkin calculation. Were there, were there other ones that stand out over the last, since 2005, 6, 7? Um, yes. Uh, so one thing that stood out to me is, um, so I went to China, and I met with the Chinese companies, and one in particular was Sinoc, and they're all you know state-owned oil companies. And the man who at that time ran Sinoc, whose name is Fu, Chairman Fu, we had dinner, and I said, well, I think this is the largest resource play in the world, and I think there's more oil to be gotten here than in the deep water of Brazil or Gulf of Mexico or West Africa. And he looked at me and he said, I think you're right. And that started, then downstream of that, I realized that the Chinese were going to put large amounts of capital into this activity, which I think now they're, they're kind of at 50 billion and counting. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, it's been a, you know, it was, it, it, I, I saw that people were going to embrace at scale. I had a similar kind of aha meeting with one of the major oil companies, I won't name which one, uh, where it was clear to me that they said, this is, this is really big. The, the thing that, you know, is pretty remarkable now that people maybe don't focus on quite enough is of the jobs created in the United States since 2005, since 2009 rather, 25% are related to the oil and gas industry, one in four. The other thing that's pretty interesting is we have today in the United States, of any large developed economy, energy prices for natural gas that are between 25% and half less than anybody else. So one of the other things that's happened is we've seen this amazing renaissance of the chemical industry in this country. There is today a backlog of nearly $300 billion of chemical projects in this country. Right? So you just look at the, all the peripheral impacts. Um, it's a dividend to the average American citizen based on their lower utility bills of about $1,500 per year per family. Here's another example of, of, of the peripheral uh, effects right here in North Carolina. My, my oldest son uh, has a tugboat company. He runs tugboats and barges. Uh, his, one of his big customers is Nucor Steel. And he gets a call from Nucor uh, a year and a half ago, and he said, Nucor had heretofore been taking iron ore from South America, bringing it to Trinidad, using the natural gas in Trinidad to further refine the iron ore to what's called direct reduced iron. And at that time, they were bringing direct reduced iron from Trinidad to some of their mills, but not all of them. And as, at the same time, scrap was going through the roof because the Chinese were buying all the scrap off, off both coasts. This, the steel mills in China were using the scrap, and Nucor could use direct reduced iron in place of scrap in their electric furnaces. So they've built a $4 billion direct reduced iron plant in Louisiana using natural gas because they believe the long-term supply is here. Um, in January, that iron will go by ship from Louisiana to Moorhead City, uh, be unloaded in Moorhead City by my son and his company, and and barge to the uh, Nucor plants. Mm -hmm. There, there is just there'll be hundreds of people uh, working just on that transportation loop alone uh, in North Carolina. It's funny when you think back to so you know 2005 is often a, a you know a benchmark that people refer to when they think about kind of the days before you know shale gas became really evident. I remember. So in 2005-06, I was uh, on the Council of Economic Advisors, and one of the big issues then we had just had Hurricane Katrina and Rita. And uh, natural gas prices shot through the roof from that because of the shutdown of, of infrastructure. Um, Alan Greenspan, the chairman of the Federal Reserve, was the federal the chairman of the Federal Reserve doesn't usually talk about ener energy prices, certainly not natural gas. He was uh, saying that we needed to import lots of LNG. People were working on regulations to fast track new LNG import terminals into the United States. That was in 2005-06. 
uh, to give it. So question, why were people so taken by surprise? I can tell you nobody in the White House, anywhere in government policy, said anything about shale gas in 2005-06. Because Why were people no, so no, taken no by one surprise? Had seen that it happened. And, and, and George Mitchell had failed for a decade. Yeah. I mean, you know, pe people kind of said, well, maybe this works. And so, so you, the notion in those days was that this might work, but it was very expensive, right? So, so you know, th there was a thought, oh, yeah, well, there's these shale bodies, and maybe we can get gas out of them, but it's going to be a six, seven, eight dollar resource. So people said, well, it can't compete with LNG. I mean, there was coal bed methane, which is another thing that we decided would have spent time on, we all spent time on, which was a similar idea, but never had the kind of productivity, but it was a very high cost resource. What happened that no one really understood was just the sort of continuous improvement process. Let me give you just an anecdote on that. So today, my numbers will be approximately correct. Today in the Barnett Shale, the average well will recover 2.8 billion cubic feet of natural gas, and it will cost about $2.8 million. So you can you know, basically find a, 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 an MCF of natural gas and for the non-oil and gas people, an MCF is a thousand cubic feet. The M stands for thousand. So it's a thousand cubic feet of natural gas. So you can find one of those and that's the unit natural gas comes in like a gallon of gasoline. Um, and you can find one of those for a dollar. When the play started, I remember this very distinctly, the wells were finding 1.8 BCF of natural gas for four dollars and for four and a half million dollars. So if you just look at the radical improvement there, so in 2005, everybody was saying, well, fine, you can find gas in the Barnett Shale for $3 a thousand, and then you put a margin on that and cost of capital, that's a $6 resource. Here's another perspective. The industry and, and everybody associated with it had been thinking of reservoirs, small amounts of, of gas or oil in, in, in place. The people who were working on the shale, like our gang and, and Chesapeake and others, all of a sudden, what we realized was, you know, you, you run that lateral for a mile and, and you can tell, you, you know what the uh, dimensions of your frack are going to be. You're basically looking at a tank uh, underground, you know, that runs, that, that may be 200 feet on each side of the pipe, yep, yep. And 20 or 30 feet, and it runs for a mile. And, and it's, you know, all, and, and, and people would do the numbers like Ralph was doing. The numbers were so big. You know, uh, I, mean, I mean, we just did a public debt offering a few months ago. On, on the road show for the public debt offering, they wanted to know how many locations we had, and we said we had 15,000. And the traditional guy, that's not credible. Not that's credible, you can't have 15,000 locations. But that's what's happening. It's hard to make the translation from what's here today and what we used to do two years ago. Ralph, what, what aspects of this do you think have taken the most you know, creativity or entrepreneurial spirit, either on the financing side or on the technology side? The, um, I think both, you mentioned both of those. I mean, you know, Size Company is a great testament to this, and he can talk about this because the, the company he has in his partner, Ronnie Arani, it's a very fine company, and they've done an amazing job. And I think a lot of it has to do with just from a operational point of view, and I'll bet Cy could tell us that they started with five people in the company and now they're a hundred. You know, and, and they've taken these companies have been built out of scratch to go out and conduct, you know, large scale, very large scale, complex drilling operations. It's amazing. There have been a number of them created. There's a company just went public called Antero. So I know the people there very well. And, you know, it started, they had, they had 12 guys in the company, men and women in the company when they started, and today they have about 300. To give you some sense of scale, they started with $30 million of capital, and the company just went public for $14 billion yeah. in, in a six-year period. So they, but those guys had to go build up brick by brick an organization designed to conduct what is basically very large-scale industrial activity. So it's been a really, it's been a testament to sort of entrepreneurial courage and determination to watch these companies, you know, and the oil and gas business carries with it, you know, it's, there's real risks associated with, you know, drilling is not a benign activity and there's things that happen and, you know, putting safety processes in place. And so there's been a really remarkably good job, in my view, by the, by the, by the entrepreneurial companies in terms of building their capabilities. The other thing is the finance. I mean, yeah, so yeah, that, that you know, size says, and that was, you know, definitely my wheelhouse. 
Um, but you know, the industry's raised now for this activity $250, $60 billion of all kinds of flavors, you know, capital markets, uh, debt financing like he talks about, you know, we've created, all, I've created about three new products that didn't exist in the capital markets, all these big international joint ventures because of just the scale of the capital. It's the largest capitalization of a new industry in the United States in its history. More it's happened quickly. It just yeah, happened. It's almost happened overnight. How about tight oil? When did, when did the <laughs> potential for tight oil first become apparent? Oh, same. It was, well, we, were, we, were, we started looking at it in 06. But, you know, a fellow, another individual, you know, a fellow named Harold Hamm. Harold, yeah. Harold's a character. He goes up to the Bakken and, you know, he was messing around up there for a long time, just sort of like George Mitchell. He, it was individuals, trial, trial, you know, it doesn't work, try something else. And, you know, all of a sudden everybody turned around and, my goodness, the Bakken's producing all this oil. And, uh, and then it, it just went from there to we're in this area in Wyoming and then the Permian and New Mexico and Texas. It just it, it got translated very quickly throughout the industry. But it was individuals who, who sort of broke the code each time. So the, I have a really great story about that. One of the things that makes my little firm different than your average investment bank is we have a big technical team. So we have embedded in our firm 45 engineers, geologists, and geophysicists. So, you know, we talk about the rocks. And so my, my whole group, we have a very deep understanding of the technology and the geology and all that. So we were trying to raise money for a project in the Eagleford Shale in the oil window of the Eagleford. Conventional wisdom was it didn't work. It was this B-factor problem, right? And because an oil reservoir, you know, an oil molecule is longer than a gas molecule. So if you don't think it works for gas, which is short and easier to move around, then you sure as heck don't think it works for oil. So the industry was all saying it was conventional wisdom. It didn't work in the Eagleford because the, you know, the rocks were just simply too tight. Um, and I have an engineer, a guy who I dearly love, who's 82 years old, who was an Amico trained engineer who works for me. And uh, he just said, I think this works. You know, he, he had rejected the Portho permeability model and he said, it does it work? He said, but I, and I just need to prove it somehow because I think it works. Well, he went and he studied the well records and found a well that had been drilled in 1996 by Conoco that was a vertical well, right? But had, been, but had fracture stimulated the Eagleford. And, that the, and then he found production records that showed that that single frack had actually produced for a long time and that the, and that the, uh, and that the calculated B factor indicated that the wells had produced a long time. We took that insight and with that single insight, we raised about $5 billion of capital to bring and develop the, what became the core of the Eagleford chip. But this is interesting because just that kind of work, so we start with five people. Yeah. We, we're, we've got a little office rented behind the Hertz office in Oklahoma City. And um, what we're doing, we, we, our first bit of money was in significant software. And we had our, the idea in Wyoming where this was. And we downloaded every single well that had been drilled over a million acres. Because the Powder River has been producing oil for long time, since the 1950s. It's covered with literally thousands and thousands of oil wells. And, and, and analyzing that data for, for almost a couple of years was what finally, you know, we think this is going to work. Of course, you had to drill the well to yeah, yeah. make sure it worked. So, so where do you think, uh, uh, I'm gonna, I want to turn to the, uh, you all in a, in a minute just because I, I see how, 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 much, how time flies. Um, so where do you think this is headed in the U.S. and internationally? Um, so uh, international is a very interesting question. Uh, so two of my clients, I won't name two, which two, uh, in, had developed, did a joint study to evaluate other shales around the world. And one of the learnings of that, this is really fascinating and it's not widely known, is that the shale bodies outside of North America, not very many of them are likely to be productive. And the reason is, is because the particular geologic properties of the shales, in particular, a lot of the shale deposition around the world has high silica content, silica sand, right? But why is that important? It means when you frack the rocks, they don't break because the sand, the silica absorbs the frack energy. So the consequence of that, and there's been a lot of failure internationally, I mean, I follow this very carefully, but like in Poland, for an example, there was a lot of money spent in Poland and it didn't work. The other issue internationally, other than the rocks not working, 
is the fact that there's very few places, there's no place in the world where you have the density of natural gas infrastructure that's needed in order to kind of do this stuff. Now, I think there's likely to be some places in Russia, and they've got coal bed methane in China, and it's not to say there's not any is going to happen. There is a, there's a shale body in Argentina called the Vaca Muerte shale, that Vaca Muerte shale that's likely to work, it's an oil shale. But point being, I don't think it's broadly disseminated around the planet. Uh, and so I don't think we're likely to see the same kind of, you know, magnitude of opportunity as we've seen in North America. Um, in terms of the domestic business, uh, I think it's now very much a, a point of the industry, you know, learning how to be efficient with, with the development of the shales and also learning how to do it in, a, in the, uh, an environmentally uh, uh, acceptable manner. Uh, you know, as you and I were talking before we started this, I think fracking is a kind of a uh, is not the issue with environmentally. I think it's all the above ground stuff. It's it's a, this is large scale industrial activity, but I just think that the industry will have to be, develop the capability to do this in a way that's as least invasive as possible. And I think that's a really really important trend. And that issue kind of develops and gets confronted every day. But I would say at its core, the, the one thing we can all take uh, a lot of comfort from, just from a, a, an American perspective, is that the industry is going to produce a lot of low-cost energy for a long period of time. You know, um, I'm considered a green person, you know, although a lot of people here probably wouldn't agree with that today since I've... Uh, uh, but, um, you know, our, our carbon emissions this year are at 1994 and below levels. And of course, I, I believe that's natural gas, you know, all the way. And the challenge for all of us is uh, going forward is whether natural gas is going to be a bridge to, a, to an economy that, is, that really is long-term uh, sustainable uh, or whether we're going to just rely on it because we have a lot of it. And, uh, and, and uh, oil, uh, you know, for me, it's, you know, watching the, how the geopolitics have changed just since this oil production that we're talking about now. I mean, the, the increase in oil production in the Eagleford Shale alone this year is equal to the entire production of the, of the country of Nigeria, yeah. you know, which is an OPEC country. It's huge. So, you know, the, the, the Saudis can, can rattle their saber about what they want us to do and other, other of the Middle Eastern countries that used to yank us around uh, at a whim, I see that the geopolitics changing, and I think that's really critical. Yeah, it's really, it's, it's an, it, it is a little unfortunate that the government, the U.S. government, hasn't embraced more fully the opportunity presented here, both from a public policy and environmental perspective. You know, just from an environmental point of view, you go, you can burn, you know, uh, a natural gas in an automobile, and it's off-the-shelf technology. And that car is going to produce two-thirds less emissions in gasoline, and it's domestically produced, cre creates domestic employment. Why we wouldn't make, you know, more of an effort to encourage that is just beyond me. But, you know, I think it's just sort of indicative of a general political paralysis the nation faces. I mean, the government hadn't done a good job of tackling much of anything. But, but the point being is that, you know, to size point, there's just manifold benefits of this. And, and, you know, it is a bounty, a sort of a gift the country's been given. And so one of the things you'd like to see, I'm totally with Si on this one, which is can we find, you know, because natural gas could be a transition to something, you know, what, what comes next. But I'll tell you the one thing this whole thing taught me more than anything, and this is sort of downstream of, uh, of our friend Matt Simmons, who said we were running out of energy. You know, if you go back and you say, if we were having this conversation in, let's say, when I graduated from Duke or there about 1985, we would have identified three big problems in the world. We would have said, you know, 1980, let's say, there wasn't enough food, right? And people that are my age remember things like the concert for Bangladesh, right? Well, in Bangladesh in 1977, four million people died of starvation. The other thing you would have pointed to is the lack of energy, right? That was just the beginning of OPEC, and, and, and that was really, uh, um, you know, a, a time where, uh, people were saying, you know, we were going to be in a stranglehold of the Saudis for the rest of time. And the third thing people would have identified then was, was you know, global Armageddon, right? We, we had the, you know, Cold War was still hot and heavy, and, you know, we were all, you know, I grew up going to bomb shelters as a kid, right? All, everybody my age would have done that as an elementary school student. 
Today, you look and you say, man, that, that's really amazing where we sit today on those three issues. Through crop genetics, you know, as much as you don't, people don't like you know, that term, but it's true. Crop genetics, funded largely by the Rockefeller Foundation, the world produces enough food comfortably to feed everybody. There's political reasons we don't get it to where it needs to go, like, you know, civil war, but the, the food exists. The, the, the energy industry has solved the energy problem. There's enough energy to run this planet. We may not choose to use it, but it exists, especially in the form of natural gas for the next hundred years for sure. There just is. It exists. It can be produced. It can be produced economically. It works. It's environmentally okay. Uh, you know, there's things you can do to mitigate virtually any environmental impact associated with natural gas can be mitigated in my view. And the third thing is, you know, it's not perfect, but you know, pretty much the Cold War ended on a pretty positive note and the risk of a nuclear Armageddon seems a lot lower. So that's a pretty positive message. You kind of go, well, that's pretty good. Now we have a whole new set of problems today. Um, like global warming, um, but the fact of the matter is that you know it's it, it is a it's a it's a notable point of optimism to say largely through technology, you know the world solved those three big problems over the last forty years. Questions? Yeah, right here. It seems like uh, the the general sentiment is that natural gas prices won't rise above five to six dollars for the foreseeable future. You, you hear that pretty regularly. Is it possible to, for us to overbuild our reliance on natural gas, or is it possible that there are unforeseen circumstances that could change the game in the other direction? I don't think, it's, I don't think the, the issue is that we're going to run out of the resource or that you know, you're going to see a reliance on $5 or $6 gas and it's $10. I don't, that's, that's, that's really not, not the issue. I, the issue is all around carbon. Yeah, I think the, you know, could you see gas prices go high for a short period of time, just the way the market functions? Sure. Okay, you know, that's just the nature of the beast. It's a, it's a just-in-time inventory system we run in this country. It just is what it is. You know, if consumers wanted long-term price stability, we could get, you know, the industry could give it to them. Nobody's been willing to pay for that. And truthfully, it's been a good deal for consumers not doing it that way. Um, so I don't see on a sustained basis that we're going to see real high prices. The one thing I would say longer term, though, is that I was talking to Sai about this before we, we, we started the panel here, and that is that as demand, structural demand is building in this country, I believe that's a good thing, right? Why is that? Well, we're starting, there was an article, very interesting, everybody should read it in the Wall Street Journal today about the adoption of natural gas and over-the-road trucks, right? Trucking is going to use natural gas. It's a very logical thing to do. Trains, we're going to use it for, for, for trains as well. Uh, it's cheaper and environmentally preferable. Why wouldn't you do that? Um, <clears throat> but the point being, as we build structural demand, one of the things is, and this is not a near-term issue, but as we get a longer-term issue, the combination of environmental constraints right, and operating capability with the industry could create a scenario longer-term where the industry can't produce the gas. Not because it's not there, but because there's other constraints. So one of the things that's, you know, that policymakers need to be sensitive to as they regulate this industry is to make sure that we, you know, you don't make it so we can't, we get, you know, we make a commitment to the stuff de facto. That's what we're doing right now. With or without government involvement, we are making a commitment to natural gas because it's so compelling economically and environmentally that people are just doing it without the government getting involved. But now if the government chooses to go over on, on top of that and regulate in a way that constrains the ability of the industry to produce the stuff, then we might see prices get real high. Question. Questions, yeah. Um, I'd be interested for both of you on, no, oh, thank you, Mark. Um, in your opinion, is the, is the land grab for, for resource plays over in North America, so acquiring property for, for production? It slowed down. It sure slowed down. <laughs> One thing about it is the shale bodies that exist in North America are known. There's no news there, right? The USGS has had those mapped for 50 or 100 years. So the only question is now has been which ones work. And um, I think the land grab is over. I mean, that's, I'm at the forefront of that. That's what I do every day. So I have really good knowledge about that because when people find new stuff, they come to me to get the money, help me, help, help me get the money. Um, but the one thing I would say that is, <clears throat> you know, would maybe say, well, you know, is this technological thing, right? And, and one of the things that I think is likely over time is that there's a number of big oil shales that are not currently developable, if that's a word, uh, for, uh, with current technology. So an example of that would be the Utica Shale in Ohio. Uh, the oil window doesn't work economically today. But 
I could envision a world where technologically things happen where that could change. And so there's some big oil resources that are hanging around that don't work. A, a big part of what size company has probably doesn't work today. There's a lot that does, but there'll be some that doesn't. And, you know, I could see a world, because there's a lot of oil in place in the, in the Powder River Basin, some of it won't be recoverable with current technology. Other questions? Yeah, in the back. How much of a boom has been and is going to be uh, shale gas versus tidal? I wouldn't separate the two. I mean, uh, in fact, you know, gas production has gone up in spite of the low prices. And, and our company is a perfect example. We, our original estimates for the wells we're drilling in a certain area of the uh, Powder River were that the gas-oil ratio was going to be one to one. For every barrel of oil we produce, we'd have one MCF of gas. Well, our gas-oil ratio is three to one. So we've, we've drilled hundreds of wells where we're producing three times the amount of natural gas you know, that we had thought was there. The economics would not work if that was just a gas well, but the, the, the liquids portion, whether it's oil or natural gas liquids, is what's carrying the economics. So there's a lot of gas moving to market today on the, what I say on the back of oil. It, this is probably one of the most important points about what's going on in the industry. It's one of the reasons that the whole idea that the United States uh, is going to be an oil exporter is probably wrong is that um, when, when people talk about um, uh, uh, U.S. liquids production, that includes what I call black oil, crude oil, and natural gas liquids. And basically, natural gas, another word for natural gas liquids is condensate. Okay, So those are actually, if you just think as the lightest is methane, then you get natural gas liquids, which are things like you know, propane, butane, ethane then you get condensate which is really very high gravity light oil it's white i mean it's clear and then you get black oil and you can get very very heavy black oil like the stuff produced in california so you get a whole spectrum of stuff of products that the earth will produce now a lot of what we produce today is condensate and natural gas liquids that stuff is very different than black oil and the reason it is is you can't put it in a refinery and make gasoline with it and, and one of the things that's happening in the country today is we are awash in natural gas liquids, and the price of that has gone down quite a lot. Virtually the only use for, other than for propane, which some people burn in their homes, the only use for natural gas liquids is chemical intermediate. You make chemical, it's an intermediate to make various kinds of petrochemicals. But the point being that condensate and natural gas liquids do not displace black oil in terms of the need for the black oil to go into a refinery to make gasoline. So that's a really important point, it's poorly understood. The, the economics and the, and the business opportunity associated with understanding what's going to happen to all these natural gas liquids is one of the most interesting business problems facing the industry, and it's a huge opportunity for the country, but nobody's really spent much time thinking about it because there's not a natural constituency to say, hey, what are we going to do with all these, these NGLs being produced? What we're basically doing with them now is we're going to build pipelines to take them from where they're being produced, like in Ohio and Pennsylvania, pipe them to Houston, and then put them on a ship and sell them someplace globally at not a great price. Now, there should be a whole opportunity to you know, do something with all those natural gas liquids and condensate, but it is probably the most poorly understood aspect of this boom has been that a lot of what we're producing is not really oil. People want to talk about it like oil, but it's not oil, and they're different. And, and you know, when in the papers the other day it said the U.S. surpassed Saudi Arabia you know, as the largest uh, energy producer. Well, that's black oil. It's the natural gas liquids and natural gas. It's all of them together. Question up here, yeah. You, yep. Uh, Ralph, you mentioned that there are uh, other ways that you could effectively offset the uh, carbon that would be emitted by using all the natural gas that might be uh, available to us. Could you go into the specifics and maybe what kind of scale is necessary to effectively offset all the natural gas if we utilize it as much as we possibly could? So you're talking about in terms of the how we would use natural gas in terms of CO2, reduction of CO2 emissions? No, uh, if we were to use natural gas in, in as, on as large a scale as we possibly could, what do you feel we would need to do to effectively uh, mitigate the CO2 emissions that would 
Well, so so I'll give you one little statistic, and um, and that is that if we took, and I think the number is the 25 dirtiest coal plants in the United States, right? So coal, virtually every coal plant in the United States, very, very few of them have have what are, scrub, what are called scrubbers, right? So when you burn CO2, when, sorry, when you burn coal to make, to make electricity, it's the most CO2 polluting thing we do uh, in terms of energy usage because coal is very dirty. It has high CO2 content naturally. You just can't fix that. But if you just shut down, the, I think it's the 30 dirtiest coal plants and, re, and replaced them with current technology gas-fired generation. So on an energy equivalent basis, that's an 85% reduction in CO2 emissions between a gas-fired plant and a coal-fired plant. If you just took the four, I think it's 30 or 40 dirtiest plants in the United States, this country could cut its CO2 emissions by 25% or 30% just doing that. And, and, and there's probably an economic benefit of doing it because you're taking, you know, a cheaper, relatively cheaper fuel. So that is a huge quantum. You go, wait a minute, you're telling me just by shutting down some, some existing coal plants and building off-the-shelf natural gas plants, we could reduce our CO2 emissions by a third? It's exactly what I'm saying. You know, the number that Ralph just gave you, in 2012, you know, there's a factor that's called carbon intensity, which is, which is the carbon... Uh, component of each GDP dollar. But we reduced our carbon intensity in 2012 by six and a half percent. It was the largest drop since 1951. And, you know, I know there's some people from RMI here, or one of my former students, but, you know, Amory Lovins was famous in 75 when he said, as an economist, you could separate primary energy use from GDP. The two, if you track the two, they just went like that. And everybody said, you can't do it. If you cut down primary energy use, you're going to knock down GDP. Well, he convinced everybody that that wasn't the case. And the next argument has been, well, if you try to limit carbon, you're going to affect GDP. And again, we're finding that whatever the means, we can separate the two. GDP can continue to grow without it being as carbon intensive as it is today. And as Ralph just said, if we moved it just into transportation uh, and then hit some big coal plants, you're talking about huge uh, reductions in carbon intensity. Now, there's an argument that natural gas, you know, is, is, is methane release is very, is very dirty, and we all know, you know, methane is 20 times worse than CO2. But that's a mechanical fix. You know, that that that's fixing pipes that are leaking. That's fixing. That, that that's 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 something that can be dealt with with some very simple regulations, and it's economical for the industry to fix it. So one other thing about natural gas, this man here can tell you something about it. There's a company that's been incubated here at Duke called NetPower, and they have technology they've developed which basically allows you uh, to capture 100% of the CO2 from a power plant. It's actually more efficient than existing combined cycle technology, but truthfully, if you could take the CO2 from a power plant, capture it, and then sequester it, and the basic way you sequester it is you put it in the ground and you store it, um, then you could have power plants produced with, you know, using natural gas that were frankly very cheap with no emissions. Um, the one thing, I, you know, I can kind of take you through each step of the natural gas production process and every aspect of it that's environmentally, uh, uh, you know, has any environmental impact you can mitigate. Now, there's a question of whether it's economically sensible from a cost-benefit point of view to do that, but it's all mitigatable, with one exception, and that's the surface impact. That's the point I made earlier, which is this is large-scale industrial activity. I mean, you know, when you get out there and you need, you know, five acres of land to drill wells and you put trucks out there and drilling rigs and all that stuff, you can't really make that stuff go away. Now, it's not permanent, right? Once you drill the well, then the well site itself is pretty benign, but the industrial activity you know, you go drive around South Texas right now, and there's a lot of stuff moving around. If you, if you want a real experience, I took my class uh, to a fracking site. I, I see Fred is here, who was in my class that year. Uh, and, it, you know, it blew everybody away. The, the horsepower that's operating on that site, the, the logistics of a fracking site, it, it's just, it's, it's, it's big scale industry. It's big scale. You can see now on satellite the, <coughs> industri the drilling activity in South Texas shows up with the same density as the cities of Houston and Dallas. So that's just give you some sense of that. Yeah. Other, uh... yes, if I... Um, I have a question. 
So how do you think the uh, natural gas, unconventional resource uh, revolution uh, is replicable in some other countries which also have abundant uh, unconventional resources? For example, in China, they also have uh, large proved reserves for natural gas. But the reason why they tap into tap, tap the resources is because first, the resource is owned by national uh, companies, which doesn't have the technology. And second, they don't have the pipeline infrastructure. Uh, so that means huge um, sunken costs, upfront costs. Um, and third, uh, uh, it's because the, um, and third, it's because uh, the geology uh, is very different from the United States, uh, and it's very difficult to uh, use the technology here to develop the natural gas in China. So how do you think the technology advances uh, uh, can help the resource in those countries to be uh, tapped? How fast do you think this uh, revolution will be replicable here? I don't think it's going to be very fast. I mean, you kind of listed the reasons. None of those are technological problems. Lack of pipeline infrastructure, that's not a technology problem, right? Land use, the other big problem in China, I mean, I spent a lot of time with some of the Chinese companies. Land use is a big problem in China, right? You know, you know, you building a pipeline and, you know, going through somebody's farm and all that business is hard. The topography is challenging in China. Where the gas is is in a relatively mountainous, the best places it's mountainous area, so it's expensive. So, you know, I think China will probably get to it at some point, but it's not a technology problem. It's a logistics problem, right? And they, and the other thing is that, and, you know, I think China is going to be really fascinating because as, you know, you, everybody would have followed, uh, you know, the, the air quality issues in China are very real and very difficult, and the populace of China is unhappy about it, the government's unhappy about it, and the fix for that is natural gas. So what they're doing in China to fix the problem is they're going to build 14 LNG importation terminals. The problem with China in terms of the pace of adoption of natural gas, though, is the construction of the infrastructure. That's the problem. The United States is blessed. It's the only country other than maybe the U.K., uh, in France, where you have really, really, uh, Italy does too, a really, really good distributed natural gas uh, basically everywhere in the country. So China's problem is logistical, it's not technological. Yes? Uh, question about downstream, I think we've, we've touched on it uh, tangentially, but the access to dive, dive a little deeper. Um, I've heard that there are 15 export terminals, at least at some stage in the, the, the permitting process. Uh, of that 15, it's, it's clear that not all of them will be permitted. I've also heard that there are eight uh, silicon, silicon cracker facilities that could potentially be invested. Um, my question to you, because you two seem to you know, be so knowledgeable in this space, is what happens downstream in the next five years? How many terminals do you see actually making it through to the working ground process? And what would that mean in terms of and both NGLs and dry gas production. Yeah, it's it's probably one of the most uh, important issues right now. The government, again, no consensus. It's all about politics. The 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 market is there for a large, you know, U.S. export business of natural gas. The politics are basically two threads. One thread is the. There's a lot of the people in the environmental movement who just want to kill natural gas because they want to kill hydrocarbons because the idea would be if we do that, then we'll force the economy onto something else that's better. That's kind of the, the mindset of people. So one of the things about that is that um, anything that's big infrastructure like the XL pipeline, I mean, the XL pipeline is Keystone pipeline. It's crazy that we're opposing that because What's going to happen instead? They're just going to build the pipeline in Canada to the Atlantic coast, to the Atlantic side of Canada. They're going to put the oil on boats and ship it anyway to Texas, right? The only difference is instead of having it on a relative, in a relatively safe boat, uh, on a relatively safe pipeline, we're going to end up having all this crude oil on boats floating around the Atlantic, which is much less safe. But the point being, you know, there is environmental uh, 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 protest against it. And I don't know how strong or effective that's going to be. The other thing is that a lot of the consumers of natural gas don't want to see LNG exports because they believe that it will drive prices up. I could give you both sides of that argument, 
but the point being, it's all about the politics. So the answer is, there are three, I think there's three export facilities that are highly likely to get built. Beyond that, I don't know. The, the second question you ask, which is a very, and it's all politics, the, the market is there for more terminals. The other thing uh, is what's going to happen to all the intermediates? This is the NGL question. It's a fascinating question, and I don't know. Shell's looking at, for an example, building a big ethane cracker in Ohio. Makes tons of sense to me. But uh, I think that there is going to be new technology and new industry built around NGLs. And the simple reason for that is it's the cheapest BTUs on the planet. If you just look around and you say, on this planet, where can you buy the cheapest BTUs that are relatively clean? There's dirty coal that's cheaper. But if you ignore dirty coal, because I don't think, I mean, I think the world's going to move away from that stuff, uh, the cheapest relatively clean BTUs on the planet are NGLs, and people are going to figure out ways to use that cheap energy. Well, I think that all that's left for me to do is, is thank uh, Ralph and Sai for a really uh, stimulating conversation. Thank you, Richard. Yeah, one thing I'd just say, just one editorial comment. Uh, I think the university is very fortunate indeed to have Richard leading our energy initiative. And uh, I think that there's a lot of exciting things going on here around energy. I think it's a great area for the university. And, and, and one of the things for all the young people, I think it's an industry that has a promising and, and bright future. And I second that thought. That's good. Produced by Duke University. Online at duke.edu.